All right, well, th yeah, thanks so much uh, to the conference organizers, to Cliff, and also to Heather for referring us uh, into this. My name is Mark Johnson. I'm SVP of Quantum Technologies and Systems Products uh, with D-Wave. Um, and I think if I wanted to leave you with uh, just a couple of ideas this afternoon, uh, I want to introduce to you the idea that there are more, there's more than one modality for quantum computing, uh, and that and that how you answer some of these important questions that you're asking about how do you uh, how do you benchmark how do you uh, provision can you solve useful problems depends on which modality you're talking about. I'm going to dig into and talk in a great more detail around uh, quantum annealing, and I want to leave you with the with the understanding that there are actual cases today of companies that are using quantum technology in their, in their operations. So just to dig a little bit further into this, um, so just, and, and actually just briefly about, about D-Wave. So D-Wave uh, spun out of uh, University of British Columbia uh, a couple of de decades ago uh, with the vision of developing and commercializing quantum computing and, and chose uh, an approach to quantum computing called uh, quantum annealing, which we'll get into a little bit more later, that's, that's allowed us to, uh, uh, much earlier, uh, start solving interesting problems, uh, develop relatively large-scale uh, commercial systems, focusing on optimization problems, and start engaging with customers early. Our, our current uh, product, current uh, flagship product, uh, D-Wave Advantage, uh, has 5,000 qubits. I'll talk a, a little bit more about that later. Um, it's actually deployed at um, a few different places, one at ULIC, uh, Fortune Centrum High Performance Computing Lab in Germany. There's a system that's uh, deployed at uh, USC in Southern California, and there's one in our facility in Burnaby. Uh, D-Wave was the first uh, to come uh, to market with a commercial quantum computer about a dozen years ago. Uh, first to market with a real-time quantum cloud service about five years ago. Uh, our focus, our, our go-to-market is focused on quantum computing as a service uh, with a really strong emphasis on professional services. So we have a, a team of really outstanding folks that will work with customers who don't need to know about quantum computing, who don't have to understand what's going on under, under the hood or how to design uh, in superconducting integrated circuits uh, to be able to solve the problems, that they, they come to the table understanding the problems they want to solve. I, I want to I take a moment to, to differentiate between a couple of different modalities for quantum computing. If at a high level we say quantum computing is really harnessing the unique physics of quantum mechanics to perform operations on data to help accelerate computing, to do computing in a different, in a different way, that's, that's a fairly high level uh, description. There are, there are different approaches to that. The one I'm going to focus on today is around annealing quantum computing, or quantum annealing, which poses optimization problems by, by posing a, a cost function, an energy function, mapping a problem into that, and then using quantum mechanics to help find either the best answer, the lowest cost function uh, uh, answer, or a very good one. Um, most of what we hear about for quantum computing is, is a different modality. It's, it's gate model quantum computing, which is really more inspired by uh, how humanity has developed uh, uh, using classical digital computing to solve, to solve problems. So this is gate model quantum computing. The, these tend to be fairly complementary in the applications and the algorithms, the approach, and the applications to which they excel at. So, Annealing quantum computing is really uh, designed around the idea of solving combinatorial optimization problems. Uh, excels at that, um, and is currently better than, for example, gate model quantum computing, and it, and it looks like it, it, always, it always will be. However, uh, there, are, there are a number of problems where you really will need uh, error corrected uh, with high quality qubits, uh, for, the, for the last speaker's point, um, uh, error-corrected gate model quantum computer to be able to solve, and particularly problems related to, to quantum chemistry modeling, modeling physical systems uh, around in the area of drug discovery, um, but, there, but there are a number of others. So we, we view both of these as important modalities to develop. D-Wave is actually uh, seriously pursuing both modalities. I'm gonna be focused on annealing quantum computer uh, this afternoon. So, okay, before 
I get into the next two charts, I promise that the, well, I'm going to go a little bit under the hood and talk a little bit about how these technologies work. But there's a really important point that the end user does not need to understand uh, the physics of quantum mechanics, does not in, need to understand uh, the, the, how, the, how the implementation works. But I just want to talk a little bit about the, the, how to think about uh, annealing quantum computing. And at the top is an equation which you don't need to sort of dig into, but it's really describing uh, the energy functional of the system, uh, which implements a cost function. There are two components to that. There's the, the right-hand side with the, with the orange labeling, which is the, essentially the problem statement. The, the sigmas there, you can think of as binary spin variables. They're binary variables. Uh, and there are two terms in that, uh, that are, whose parameters are programmable. The, the, the quadratic term uh, enables interactions between uh, qubits, between variables. And you can, you can influence a pair of variables to wish to be anti-correlated with each other or to be, have it be energetically preferable for them to be correlated with each other, so as constraints between or influences between variables in a problem. And similarly, the linear term uh, allows for biases on individual variables. And those, and those parameters, those H's and J's, which a user could input or could be input by, generated by a hybrid algorithm, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, who, if, if one need not get down into the, this level of detail, um, are, are, are the problem statement, are an encoding of the problem statement. And on the left-hand side, the sort of the, the, the term with a, the sigma x that's labeled quantum fluctuations is a, is a term that's really around uh, delocalizing the Hamiltonian, delocalizing the system. Uh, this, is the, this is where, in the, the, where the, the spin variables on the right are the basis, the, the, the computation basis. The spin variables on the left, those operators are really uh, causing the system to delocalize into a, a superposition of a really a large number, in fact, all possible spin variable combinations amongst which the best, the best answer exists. And the way the algorithm works, just at a very high level, uh, is that those two terms in the Hamiltonian, in the energetic description of the system, uh, can be modulated with an envelope function. And we begin the algorithm where the delocalized term is maximal. And the ground state, the lowest energy configuration of the system in that, in that state in the, in initially is delocalized. So in your, you're in this large superposition. And then you imagine you had a great dimmer switch and you could gradually tune down that delocalizing term and, and amplify and tune up the problem statement that you had already programmed onto that chip. Tune up the problem statement. And in such a way, this is quantum annealing. It's inspired by something, an adiabatic, something called the adiabatic theorem in quantum mechanics. And the idea is that then this preferentially selects out from that large superposition. At the end of the day, you either have the best possible answer, a lowest energy answer, or a low energy answer that may not be the best, but is still a very good one, uh, preferentially so. So that, at a, at a high level, is the, is the picture of annealing, annealing quantum computing. And you can think of it as exploring this landscape. And by harnessing this sort of this delocalizing term, this is where the quantum mechanics comes in, uh, you're looking for the lowest energy point in that landscape, and, and the delocalization allows you to avoid getting trapped into a local minima that would be the bane of many classical algorithms that might be searching locally on that, on that landscape. Now, the next layer down, and again, I promise there's no reason that a, that a user needs to get into this, but the conference organizers reviewing the, the charts were quite concerned that I should show you something a little bit about how we do this and not just not just what the, what the answer was. Um, and, but actually, it relates to a question that we just had here. I also consider myself a, a chip guy. At the core of this technology uh, is a VLSI scale, superconducting integrated circuit. We fabricate this uh, mostly in the US, mostly in, in Minneapolis at, at Skywater, but, we, but, it's, but that's not the only place. I say VLSI scale because it's got the current generation of our technology has just over a million Joseph's injunctions on it. Circuits in superconducting integrated technology tend to be constructed from wire loops interrupted by Josephson junctions, superconducting wire loops. The qubit is just a superconducting wire loop uh, with Josephson junctions that's engineered so that it's classically bistable. There's a, a circulating current going one way or another way. Those are the zero and the, and the one in the, in, the, in the computation basis. Uh, Intercubit couplers that, uh, that implement the J that I talked about, the, the, the 
interaction between qubits is uh, also schematically looks the same, but it's engineered not to be bistable, it's monostable, and it implements a, a magnetic susceptibility that's tunable, that's programmable, and that's, and that's how the sort of the interaction between the qubits can be, is implemented. Um, the lion's share of the, of the circuitry on these chips is actually classical control circuitry or readout circuitry also implemented out of superconducting devices. Um, we're currently at, so I said BLSI scale, currently at the 250 nanometer, you know, technology node. So, you know, some relatively old school lithography, uh, lots of room to scale here. We're not in any way limited by IC technology. Um, I find this, there's, there's plenty that's written about this, but this is not the point of, of this talk. But if you're curious about this later, you know, look up some of my publications or come, come talk to me, as we published a great deal about how we do that. Um, I'm showing here as over time a, a series of uh, deployed quantum deployed annealing quantum <coughs> computers. On the y-axis, I'm showing the sum of the number of qubits plus the number of interqubit couplers um, in that in that system as uh, as a measure of the complexity of the problem, the optimization problem that could be encoded there. The D-Wave one, uh, as I was saying, was back in around 2011. It had about 100 qubits on it. Uh, we've had five su subsequent generations of, five total generations of commercially available quantum computer. Uh, the most recent that we've deployed is our advantage, and then, a, and then a performance update of that, which has the 5,000 qubits, which each qubit is connected to 15 other qubits, so direct interactions with 15 other qubits. Um, and then we're working now, my friends uh, back home and I are, are working hard on Advantage 2, which will ultimately feature 7,000 qubits, where each qubit will be connected to 20 other qubits, and that importantly, not represented well on this, on this chart, uh, it, the, the integrated circuit fabrication stack has been completely revamped uh, from the ground up uh, with a focus on improving the, the, the qubit coherence uh, analogous to the, to the qubit quality that the, the pre previous speaker was, was talking about, which, which translates into and is important for effectiveness uh, of problem solve quality of answer uh, in, in quantum annealing. Um, I just want to take a moment to, am I, how am I doing on time? Okay. Um, this, was a, this was an interesting uh, paper that came out just last year uh, where we, we actually were able to see uh, performance scaling advantage. This is for applying to quantum spin glass problems, so large cubic spin glass problems, which are really more in the sort of quantum simulation, physical quantum simulation side, but had the advantage because they go through what physicists call a second order phase transition, that there is, you could sort of theoretically predict how the scaling, how the scaling should follow um, as you, as you um, are, are looking at different problem sizes. And in this plot, we're actually showing approach to optimality on the plot on the right here is on the y-axis is sort of residual energy. So lower is closer to the optimal solution. H lower is better, higher is, uh, is not as good solution. And then moving to the left and the right, the x-axis is showing the amount of time that's been allowed for the algorithm to, to compute. So how, how long were you allowing the, the algorithm to run? And the blue dots are the annealing quantum computer, our, our current product advantage system, um, and showing that it's following along for most of that curve, uh, the theoretical prediction. This is significant because this is showing it's consistent with you have thousands of qubits now that are following Schrodinger equation dynamics um, over, over a reasonable range, uh, you know, so at a large scale over a reasonable range here. Second thing that was significant about this plot for us is it shows that against comp uh, competing classical algorithms, in this case quantum Monte Carlo, simulated annealing, that the scaling, the approach to optimality is faster with annealing quantum computing. So it's a, it's a scaling advantage in this context. And then the third thing that's significant about this to me is that foot where we are passing uh, beyond the sort of the coherence limit, the decoherence time, uh, the algorithm is running longer than the coherence time of the technology, and we see the departure from the uh, ideal uh, behavior. Uh, and you can see very clearly, at least this is what I take away from this, is that as we increase the cubic coherence time, uh, the, the, I can move further to the right and I should still be on that line, and that will simply suppress that foot, push us towards better quality answers. And this is so one of the 
one of the, one of the cases where you can see fairly clearly how improving uh, coherence will improve the problem performance or optimization problems. I want to introduce a really important idea around, uh, I, I also agree with something the previous speaker mentioned about, but we would say that we think any useful, actually a couple previous speakers mentioned this, any useful application of quantum computing will likely be hybrid with a non-trivial application of classical computing um, driving also the, the quantum computer. Uh, a lot of the talents and capabilities of those two different approaches are, are, are complementary, and, and why wouldn't you also try and bring in a, a large uh, classical computer to help solve um, part of the problem? This is one uh, published example we have where uh, we are, are applying uh, a, a classical algorithm uh, to solve a much larger cubic spin glass, in this case, problem than can be fit onto an individual quantum processor chip. And in this algorithm, there's, it's, it uses a patching approach to break off chunks of it to then feed off to the quantum computer. And in, in this work, we were comparing the effectiveness of this on using two subsequent generations of our annealing quantum computer. This isn't always the best way of doing it, but I include this example here because there's a reference. If you're curious about it, we have open source code associated with this. Okay, and uh, and you can um, and and you can you can look into it in more detail. But generally speaking, uh, we think hybrid computing is the best approach, uh, and and we make available through our Leap Quantum Cloud servers hybrid solvers that also allow for that don't necessarily use a patching approach, use other approaches, but but make available uh, constraints, uh, allows for specification of constraints and 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 uh, a quadratic model. And most of our business customers are using this approach, using the hybrid approach. Uh, so briefly, the last thing I wanted to, to just get into is that we have, we have many, many uh, sort of customers that are, are in various stages of either just sort of testing the waters, looking at small scale prototypes, but also uh, all the way up the chain to production scale and, and saying, can I use this hybrid technology, uh, hybrid classical plus quantum annealing hybrid solvers? to solve my problems. Uh, one, one that's actually, that's been in, in production for now quite a while, if you come up to BC, if you come up to Vancouver uh, and visit us up there, if you look out and see a Save on Foods uh, delivery truck taking groceries uh, around as you can get your groceries delivered, that driver's schedule was computed using our annealing quantum computer, using our hybrid solver. And so Save on Foods early on during the pandemic and uh, looked at, started talking to us. This is a case where you know, our professional services team worked with them and came up with a solution uh, that was better than what they were doing, better than what they were doing, and so they're, they're, they're currently using this. Um, Denso uh, has, has explored a number, of, a number of interesting use cases for, around, say, taxi uh, assignment and, uh, and, and, and can come up with, uh, came up with scenarios where you either had fewer miles traveled and or uh, uh, shorter wait times, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, Savantex was an interesting case where uh, they optimized operations of Pier 300 at the Port of Los Angeles. There's a, a terminal for shipping containers, rubber tire gantry, cranes uh, move back and forth quickly and deliver crates, uh, these, these shipping containers, to trucks that are coming in in a, in a certain order. And, were, and got improved performance uh, using, again, a hybrid, a hybrid solver. So they had the classical algorithm up front, but that was call, calling the quantum computing. What's significant, one thing significant about Savantex is that they used their own hybrid technology. They called, our, we, they called our quantum computer directly, and they were a very savvy customer and were able to develop, had the capability of developing their own hybrid approach. All of these modalities are, are possible, um, but the point is, if you are curious about, can I use this technology now? Uh, first of all, I hope, I hope that you'll see that maybe, maybe, uh, you, and then maybe that question is not answered. Maybe you shouldn't wait. Maybe you should take a look. Uh, if, you, if you come in and, uh, and join, sign up on, on Leap, it's free, and, and you can get access to information about the use cases that I showed you. You can get access to all sorts of documentation and code samples, et cetera. Um, and you can learn a, a great deal more about it. Thank you.